cette vidéo. Yeah. Welcome to the Sound of Economics, the podcast series by Bruegel, the Brussels-based economic think tank, which this week is holding a series of exceptional live recording sessions to cover our analysis of the economic consequence of the war in Ukraine as it is unfolding. I'm Giuseppe Porcaro, and uh, I'm here with our senior fellow, Nicola Veron, who is sitting in Washington, D.C. Hi, Nicolas. Hi. And I'm happy to have with us also Silvia Merler, who is the head of research at Algebris Investments. Hi, Silvia. Thanks for joining Hi. us today. Nice to be here. Um, we would like to discuss today about the sanctions imposed on Russia and the ripple effects on the financial markets. I would like also to remind you that you can ask questions during this live recording session by connecting to Slido, uh, slide.do, and typing there the hashtag uh, sanctions finance. We will also have it on our um, Twitter feed. So please, uh, please don't hesitate to participate. Um, going back to the topic. So things are moving very fast on the war front. And we at Bruegel don't want to substitute ourselves to uh, news outlets uh, who are covering the events. But what we would like to try to do is to attempt a first analysis of the consequences at the economic level. In this specific episode, as I said, we're going to look at the sanctions that the US, the EU, and the UK have been approved in the past few days, uh, which many other countries are, are, are joining as well. And we've seen so far three kinds of sanctions. One is targeted at individuals, and there is a set of more systemic ones, one targeted to banks, and the other one targeted to the Central Bank of Russia. To, to set the scene and also explain and walk through our listeners those, uh, those measures, Nicolas, could you, could you help us to understand a little bit better, give us a little bit of a compass over there? Yeah, I think you already pretty much did, uh, Giuseppe, and did it well. Uh, these are the financial sanctions. We're not talking about trade sanctions or other uh, types of sanctions that uh, can be important. Um, but if you look just at the financial sanctions, as you just said, there are of three main buckets. Uh, the first one is sanctions on individuals, so we call them oligarchs, but you know, it's all kinds of individuals connected to the regime, including Mr. Putin himself. Uh, so that means uh, that their foreign assets are frozen or even uh, seized, uh, and, um, and that uh, basically they have a more difficult life um, than before when they could shop in Milan and uh, go to shows on roadways and, and, and things like that. Um, the second one is sanctions on individual Russian banks. Uh, and here, um, it's often uh, mentioned in connection to SWIFT, which is a global uh, financial sector infrastructure, which is basically a messaging system for banks. So that's where banks exchange messages about international transactions. But actually, the sanctions go beyond that. Uh, and there have been sanctions on banks announced by the US and the European Union in particular, but it's kind of a developing story. So the EU uh, sanctioned three Russian banks um, last week before the invasion, and they added four more today, but that still represents only one quarter of the Russian banking system, more or less. Uh, and, uh, and so it's still a very partial action that doesn't affect the entire Russian banking system, um, by which I mean that even after the, I think, 10-day period that they have taken for, you know, bank, is that they have uh, defined for banks to get their uh, houses in order, uh, only one quarter of the Russian banking system will be disconnected from SWIFT. So it's not a full disconnection of the country. And then the third thing, which you mentioned also, Giuseppe, is the sanctions on the Russian Central Bank and specifically the freezing of their foreign reserves uh, in all the jurisdictions that participate, which include, of course, uh, the United States, the uh, Eurozone with the ECB, um, other EU countries, Canada, the United Kingdom, but also Japan, uh, Switzerland, um, Singapore, and others. Uh, so, uh, so it's not just the West, it goes beyond the West, it's a global coalition, which is a bit ad hoc, which includes 
offshore financial centers like Switzerland or even, for example, Monaco, uh, which had never taken that kind of sanctions before. Uh, so, so I think this is, uh, is really interesting. It's also interesting because, you know, there have been examples in the past of sanctions against central banks, for example, with Afghanistan, Iran, um, Venezuela, you name it, but, but never a central bank that is part of the kind of the inner circle, if I can put it that way, like the Central Bank of Russia, it's a full member of the Bank for International Settlements, the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee. I mean, I know these names are not familiar to many in our audience, but that's kind of the core of the global financial system. So, so this, this is hitting much more at the core than any previous action, including, believe it or not, during World War II. So when the, when the Bank for International Settlements didn't cover itself with glory by basically collaborating with the Reichsbank of the Nazi regime. Uh, so, um, so this is a big deal. Sorry, I, I should probably stop here. Uh, but I think, you know, sanctions against individuals, uh, very differentiated. Sanctions against banks, SWIFT, working progress. So far, the EU package is kind of underwhelming. Um, and sanctions against the Russian Central Bank, completely unprecedented, big deal, massive impact, uh, deterioration of the ruble and of financial stability in Russia. The Russians didn't see that one coming. So that's the one that is most forceful, forceful at this point. Thank you, Nicolas. This uh, complements uh, very, very well the overall frame of the situation. Now, what I would like to understand, and I turn my eyes to Sylvia, but I would like to understand or to start to understand is how those measures which are unprecedented, which are particular, uh, depends on, on, on the different measures that we are speaking, how those measures are actually having the, the intended effect of crippling the Russian economy. Uh, and we've seen just to, today the the one one of the many news that that are arriving is the closing down of Sberbank in in uh, in in Europe. Uh, so is this bank was not really part of the of the ones that that were targeted uh, uh, by by the measures. So it seems like uh, one of the collateral effects. But maybe we we can start with that because it was the news of the day. But getting a little bit more of an idea how those measures are hitting the financial system in Russia. Yeah, I think I will not start from that because it, it's a bit of a consequence of how uh, the measures are hitting Russia. So I'll, I'll get to that at the end. Um, I think long, long story short, what you could say is the Russian economy, economy did a 20 year U-turn in two days, uh, pretty much in terms of the macroeconomic situation that it currently finds itself in. Um, Nicola was saying the Russians did not see this one coming. Um, I agree with that. I think a lot of the uh, commentary that's been put out also trying to understand the rationale for war was really centered on this idea of fortress Russia. So this idea of the Russian economy um, being able to withstand isolation for a prolonged period of time. Uh, I think that was a reasonable assumption to make, uh, but that was based on one piece of information that drastically changed over, uh, over this week, which is the access to international reserves uh, by the central bank. And I think that one measure, that one uh, sanction is probably the most unexpected one, and it is the most consequential one in terms of macroeconomic uh, impact. Um, speaking a little bit about that, so the Russian uh, central bank has a huge amount of reserves uh, in the order of around $630 billion. Uh, um, something that's interesting is some, clearly someone was um, thinking, um, uh, looking forward, I mean, uh, having a forward looking approach to this, but um, between 2014, so following the, uh, the Crimean War till today, the composition of those reserves, uh, both in terms of where they were geographically located and in terms of the currency composition, it changed very significant, significantly. So back in 2014, it was mostly euro and dollars. Um, today, it's mostly gold and yuan. So um, composition shifted from mostly uh, the West towards the East and um, actual dollar commodity that is mostly held at the, at the Central Bank of Russia. Now, even so, uh, the sanctions that was imposed on the Bank of Russia effectively makes it uh, impossible for, uh, for the bank to access around 40% of their international uh, reserves. Why is that important? It's important because um, if you look at how much, like what, what you would use these reserves for, um, the obvious thing is paying for trade, paying for imports. 
um, the amount of, res of reserves that the central bank would have in normal times. So if, if, uh, if it had access to the entire amount of reserves would be sufficient to pay for around two years of imports uh, that Russia typically, uh, typically uses. So that's quite a long time. Um, going back to this idea of fortress Russia, right? So the idea that you can isolate yourself from the international financial system for, for as long as two years, if you actually can access your entire pool of reserves, except you, you cannot do that anymore now. Uh, so suddenly the time that you can live without having to massively curtail your import has been halved by, by these reserves. Uh, and that is before taking into account other uh, ripple effects like what, what we have seen in the past few days um, uh, runs on banks for, uh, for, for foreign currency. So people trying to uh, get as much uh, foreign currency as they possibly can because they anticipated correctly that the domestic currency, the ruble, would, would um, collapse in value as it actually did by 30% on, on Monday. So this uh, imposes additional pressure on the central banks and it means your amount of reserves, which is already uh, significantly lower than you were expecting it to be, it's also melting faster uh, than you probably had anticipated. So all these factors effectively put pressure on, uh, on the Russian economy and we've seen that in the collapse of the ruble on one end and also in, um, in the significant increase in the estimated probability of default of the Russian government that we can see out of credit default swaps on, uh, on the market at the moment following the imposition of capital controls. So how does all this tie into the, your Sberbank question? Um, so Sberbank is a Russian bank that also has a subsidiaries in uh, part of Eastern Europe, so part, uh, in Austria, Hungary, and a few other uh, Eastern EU countries. Uh, some of those subsidiaries experienced uh, effectively bank runs uh, when it was announced, like this, the European sanctions were announced um, for pretty much the same reason I was explaining in the Russian context. So in this case, it would be uh, clients of, of uh, those banks anticipating that they might come under pressure, uh, they might fail for whatever reason, they might not be able to reimburse uh, deposits that they were holding there. And this being a self-fulfilling uh, kind of event uh, led the, the two banks to be declared failing or likely to fail by uh, the European uh, authorities. And I hope that kind of ties all the things together yes, in an understandable um, way. <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask Nicola to follow up on Sparebank, but before that, because we, I, we had a, a question from the audience, which uh, I think uh, very much goes in line with what you just said, maybe just a confirmation, uh, a question from Sebastian Mack from the Jacques, the Jacques Delors uh, Center in Berlin. Um, he, was, he was asking which will do more damage to the global financial system, the exclusion of Russian banks from SWIFT or the freezing of Russians' central bank reserves. I think it's very much connected to the reflection that you both were having at the moment. So maybe maybe I wanted to take it uh, uh, at that stage uh, before we move more into the consequences for, for the, those specific banks. So I, I don't think we should look at the two things in isolation. They, mm. they do reinforce each other. Uh, the fact that the Russian central banks cannot access its full amount of reserves obviously has implications for uh, uh, potential defaults and losses in the Russian economy. Now, the fact that this, the Russian economy is also tied to the uh, global financial system via SWIFT, and now a lot of the transactions that would normally take place, of the payments that would normally take place, uh, cannot take place, or at least are going to be significantly delayed until a, a, an alternative way is found. Uh, so uh, th those two things tie together and I think reinforce each other. I don't know if Nicolas has a different opinion on that, but you know, I mean, I think Sebastian's question was about the damage to the global financial system. And I think there is a prior in that question, which is the global financial system is damaged. Um, I'm not sure one can distinguish between the damage from the Russian aggression on Ukraine and the damage from the reaction by the US, the EU, and other jurisdictions in terms of sanctions. So, so which one is most damaging? Uh, in a way, if the sanctions... Uh, participate in uh, a punishment of Russia 
that makes it less likely that this kind of invasion happens in the future, I would argue perhaps provocatively that this is stabilizing for the world, but also for the global financial system. In other words, uh, I will very much echo what Sylvia just said, which is in, in this kind of situation, in wartime, it's very difficult to isolate one action from the rest. Everything happens at the same time. And, Everything is um, endogenous, to use exactly. the yeah, word that economists love. Yeah, let's let put a bit of jargon into this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so um, so so I think the, the everything comes from the Russian invasion, which frankly I didn't see coming. I thought until the last moment that uh, uh, the Russian regime would not be that reckless, uh, and that's highly destabilizing. Uh, whether the sanctions are add to that destabilization or are in the big scheme of things stabilizing because they uh, re-establish uh, better incentives, I think time will tell. If I can add just one very quick yes, thing please, this before we move on to the to the banks. Um, one thing that I think it's important to understand is that even the SWIFT um, sanction uh, is a sanction on, so to speak, the mean you use to perform transaction. It's not a sanction of preventing or prohibiting certain transactions. In particular, a lot of discussion is um, concerned energy transactions, so payment for uh, for energy transactions, even in the U.S., when uh, a similar measure was taken before the SWIFT, uh, the SWIFT um, sanction was introduced, energy payments were exempted. So um, there's another side to the story, uh, which is whether Europe and uh, allies will ever get to the point of actually um, of actually enforcing also um, um, pro prohibition of transaction, for example, on energy, on oil and gas. Um, so all these things are currently allowed. Uh, we know that this is a lifeline of the of the Russian economy. So of course that option uh, remains open. The fact that it remains open um, is, is presumably um, supposed to work as an incentive to correct behavior to uh, to quote what Nicola was saying, but it, it's, a, it's a part of the story that needs to be taken into account as well. Great, maybe we can go back now to the ripple down effect on the banks and um, the spare bank, uh, letting our listeners understand a little bit better this specific episode within this broader frame. I mean, I, I think Sylvia already said it, the spare bank, AG is uh, a bank in Austria, which is uh, which was, I think, fully owned uh, by Sberbank in Russia, which is the largest Russian bank. Um, and it itself, it had subsidiaries uh, in Croatia, in Slovenia, and I think in Hungary, Sylvia, you may know be better than me, but I think the Hungarian operation was a subsidiary of Sberbank AG, uh, not of Sberbank Russia directly, right? Mm, yeah, I think so. Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think so. Anyway, what happened is that um, the ETB said, or the, maybe uh, the single resolution board in Brussels, I don't remember the exact communication, that the Sberbank AG in Austria was um, uh, becoming illiquid. Uh, there were a number of its uh, creditors or depositors that wanted to be repaid, and that was becoming disordered. Uh, that's basically what they say. Uh, and so they say we had to take actions. This bank was becoming likely to fail. So we declared it failing or likely to fail, which I understand was in this case a joint decision of the European Central Bank and of the Single Resolution Board, which are the authorities in charge of that in the Eurozone under the so-called banking union. Uh, and, uh, and therefore they took uh, you know, actions with uh, the tools they have. Initially they imposed a moratorium on all the liabilities of Spare Bank AG, which means everything was frozen for two days. And uh, Late yesterday, they announced uh, the end of the moratorium, the fact that Sberbank AG itself in Austria was put into liquidation. I think that's being managed by a court. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, subsidiaries uh, in Croatia and uh, Slovenia are being purchased by local banks. So that's very orderly. They're you know, out of the game now. They're in other hands. Uh, and the one in Hungary is also being liquidated by the Hungarian authorities. Of course, that's outside of the Eurozone. Um, uh, in an orderly way. So, you know, problem solved. Uh, so the big question is, so first, will depositors lose money? Apparently not. If I get the communication right from uh, what I've read this morning, 
Uh, some creditors may lose money on Sparabank AG, but also depositors, including uninsured German depositors, which had piled up into that bank for whatever reason, uh, yield chasing, um, are going to get their money back, apparently. Uh, so basically, the authorities took action early enough that there was enough left in the bank to reimburse all the depositors, if not all creditors. Um, the second question is, is there a contagion from zero to other banks? And I think the short answer is no. There is a there's a separate question, which is the big Eurozone banks, which have big operations in Russia or exposures in Russia. So that's Societe Generale, Raiffeisen, Unicredit, Intesa San Paolo, ING in particular, but not only those. Mm. So how, how will that play out? But that's a different question because that's, that's about their Russian operations, not what's happening in the Eurozone. In the Eurozone, uh, there are uh, one or two other significant Russian or Russian-owned banks like BTB in Germany, RCB in Cyprus, none of this is very big. Uh, and basically I don't expect this to create massive contagion. So I think uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the systemic stability uh, in the Eurozone or, at, or for that matter elsewhere in the world um, in large financial jurisdictions at this point. Um, so if I may be a little bit not provocative, but kind of echoing uh, several questions that are now floating the Slido uh, page. Uh, are you trying to argue that there are no systemic consequences of the of the of these sanctions on the banking system in at least at the European level? Or shall we say a little bit more about this broader picture kind of, of level? Like this maybe applies for the specific case of the banks we just mentioned, but there is uh, an actual consequence that we need to be aware of and, and start to discuss because this is uh, the, in several, let's say in several sources, there are several questions from the, from the listeners about, uh, about that, what, uh, what actually is going to happen. I don't know if who, if Sylvia or- Do you want or, to uh, have a go at this or yeah. should I? No, I, you, you start, I can. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen the questions on Slido, so I don't know exactly how they're formulated. I think, you know, as usual, there is a lot of disinformation going on, uh, some originating from Russia. And I think uh, one of the messages from Russia is we're strong, you're weak. So the current situation financially is the EU is strong and Russia is weak. And that's probably, you know, difficult to reconcile. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is a lot of disinformation coming from Russia going on. Uh, you know, propagating uh, false rumors that there is instability in the European uh, financial system that actually doesn't exist. Now, having said that, uh, you know, this is a big shock. The, the shock of the invasion, not the shock of uh, whatever actions uh, the European Union is taking, but just the shock of the invasion. This was not anticipated by the markets, by and large. Uh, it's a massive change in the, you know, in our world um, and things are de developing on the ground, of course, resistance by Ukrainians, uh, difficulties by the Russian military, but the Russian military is also very big and has a lot of firepower and it's willing to use it, including against civilians. So this is happening. It's a background of everything we're uh, talking about. And this is destabilizing. It's destabilizing for the world. It's destabilizing for the world financial system and for the European financial system. So there's this big shock. Uh, do the sanctions add to the destabilization? It's not obvious to me. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say so. I think it's a proportionate response. Actually, in the case of the EU sanctions on Russian banks, I think it's not even proportionate. It's too weak. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and so, but it can be fixed in the next few days. We'll see what happens. Uh, so, uh, so I don't think there is destabilization coming specifically from there. There are pockets of vulnerability as I mentioned, Eurozone banks exposures to Russia, this issue of the Russian banks in the Eurozone. I think the Russian banks in the Eurozone is already solved as we speak, and that has been done in an orderly way. The exposures of European banks in Russia is still a bit of a question mark. I expect it to be um, much clearer in the next few weeks, if not days. Uh, I don't think, because it, that has been to a certain extent anticipated and stress tested by the relevant authorities. So I don't expect massive instability com to come from there. Uh, now, there can be other risks. For example, the likelihood of cyber attacks by Russia on the European financial system has increased dramatically with the invasion. 
uh, and, uh, and that's a risk. It may be destabilizing in the near term. Who knows? Sylvia, do you completely yes, agree with yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the uh, particularly when it comes to the question of the banks we were mentioning earlier, this is a very, very idiosyncratic case, uh, and I don't think it will uh, spill over or replicate uh, in, in in any way across the eurozone. Regarding exposures of banks, uh, eurozone banks uh, with with activities in Russia. Um, even there, I think there are distinctions. So um, there are outliers. Raiffeisen is obviously the obvious one. Um, for the other banks we're talking about, I mean, exposures is, are significant, but still in proportion to, um, to the overall activities of the bank is not so relevant. So there is an obvious case where there is, there is quite evident weakness. Um, in the other cases, I think it's, it's less clear cut in terms of the impact it will have. Um, as Nicola was saying, this has been um, already uh, looked through in a way because the ECB had, had asked, um, I think it was a month ago or even a couple months ago to, to the banks to, um, uh, to, to be transparent about their, their exposures to Russia. Uh, so the, in a way this was already known. Um, and so it doesn't come as a big surprise, a big shock. Um, the question I think will be also for those bank operating uh, they are banks who have obviously made investment in terms of expanding their network over the over the past years. Um, what do they do with it? So even aside from the obvious outlier case of Raiffeisen, um, I think the question is, do you just walk away from it? So you just don't shell the problem in a way. Um, you obviously take the equity loss, but at the same time, you sort of um, remove potential problems down, down the line, or you just try and wait it out and see, you know, like where this goes. Uh, where, where the geopolitical, the military situation goes, whether there's any resolution or, uh, or not. And I think that's, uh, that's probably the most interesting question to ask and the, the most difficult decisions that uh, management will have to take or authorities will have to force in a way. We'll, we'll, have to see, we'll have to see what happens there. And it's tied to how the military situation will evolve necessarily. There are some other questions from the audience and I would like to give as much space as possible to them because uh, that is also one of the reasons why we wanted to have this as a live session rather than uh, a normal recorded podcast. Um, for example, we have an anonymous who is asking, speaking about the effects, uh, is asking what will be the effect of all these sanctions on the market of sustainable finance, if there is any. Uh, good one. Uh, I think uh, that, that that question has a lot of angles. Uh, there is obviously the sovereign angle to this. Um, it was quite, I think it was quite interesting to see um, ESG rating agencies rushing to downgrade uh, Russian sovereign debt uh, a couple of days ago when this happened. So uh, I would say clearly being behind <laughs> In terms of their assessment of the sustainability risk of that particular uh, that particular sovereign debt, so that's one angle. The other angle is obviously, I think, energy, um, and this is something that ties to the discussion we had before. So so far, um, we still enjoy flows and, and promises of flows of Russian gas from uh, Russia uh, for Europe. This is uh, a very sizable issue in terms of the amount uh, of energy consumptions that we cover through imports of Russian gas. So if that were not to be the case, we would have to resort to alternatives. So some of those alternatives are uh, very polluting. I mean, it's been mentioned the possibility to, uh, to, to ramp up um, coal-powered uh, uh, energy and uh, electricity generation. So that would obviously be something that goes completely against what has been the, um, the path followed uh, in Europe over the past few years. It also goes against the, the, the whole uh, narrative and the whole uh, direction sustainable mm -hmm. finance has been going over the, past, um, over the past years. And so it will trigger questions as to whether uh, you know, national security considerations, Trump uh, consider considerations that had been uh, had been becoming prominent, uh, ever more prominent over the past few years in terms of, you know, like directing flows of capitals across different activities in the real economy. 
it's an open question, I, I think. I would say, uh, just on that, uh, not, not disagreeing with Sylvia, but uh, there could be also a positive effect, which is reducing uh, Europe's uh, reliance on gas uh, over the medium term, because gas is a less polluting energy than coal or oil, but it's still a, 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 a greenhouse uh, emission um, energy. So, um, so one possible effect of that is that the EU will get its act together in a way it wasn't able to in the last decade, will really work over the next, say, five years uh, on a kind of post gas prompt transition, if I can put it that way, uh, uh, cutting its reliance on Russian gas and adopting a, an accelerated investment into sustainable energy production uh, to achieve that objective. So ironically, I agree with Sylvia. In the short term, that means more pollution because we have to you know, get energy where it is and, uh, and, and, and some of it will be uh, more polluting than, um, than what we're, we're, we may be losing from Russia. But in the medium term, uh, it's not clear that the, the balance is so uh, negative. No, I agree. I mean, there's obviously a timing issue there. So short term, uh, there's, there are some difficult choices to make. Um, I think medium term, the question is what, what, what kind of medium we're talking about in the sense that even if you assume doubling uh, production of energy from renewable resources every year, that it takes still quite some time um, to fill up the deficit that in energy that you, would, uh, that you would have if you were to ditch Russian gas completely. Um, even assuming that it can be compensated partly with LNG imports and all the, the, other, uh, the, the other options that are out there. So it still takes quite some time to get there. So it will obviously be an, a sustainable uh, finance investment opportunity for that period of time. But meanwhile, you have to balance this other kind of considerations in the short run. And before we, we move on, uh, before we move on to another topic, I want to mention the extraordinary work done by our colleagues at Bruegel, Georg Sachmann, uh, Simone Tagliapetta, and others uh, who have been documenting precisely this question of the post gas prom transition and how Europe can cope if, for whatever reasons, uh, the current deliveries of Russian gas are uh, terminated. Uh, and I think this has been a major contribution to the collective understanding of those issues uh, in Europe in the last few days and recent past. Uh, absolutely, Nicolai, and we are going to link up because we had an episode of The Sound of Economics earlier this week on Monday on this, uh, on this issue together with Simone and, uh, and Guntram Wolf. We are going to link it up to in the show notes as well as the backgrounders that you just mentioned. Um, moving to another topic, because... Uh, uh, we are really trying to understand the impact on the financial markets over there. The other big thing that uh, that that seems seemed not to to be too impactful, but today there were quite a lot of news on it, uh, was on the market of crypto. I mean, of course, crypto uh, becomes uh, a very um, very soon uh, seems to become very soon some sort of uh, um, uh, how to say. Uh, uh, an asset that that is being grasped at the moment uh, because it's decentralized in the moment where uh, there is uh, the, the 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 sanctions and and all these uh, um, issues we've been saying around the banks on one side and and the reserves on the other side. Um, what is your take on that? I mean, we've been seeing bitcoins uh, going uh, skyrocketing, and also on on certain markets in Russia, uh, even uh, even going uh, topping up. You know, like uh, I think it was at forty five thousand uh, in in the in, in the global markets, and some some Russian websites were reselling at sixty thousand um, or something like this. Uh, What's your take on that? I mean, what does it tell us beside the story about the, the moment? You know, we've been seeing peaks of bitcoins all the time. But what does it tell us? You know, more on the on the systemic side about uh, about the use of crypto. I think our listeners might be very interested about that. My view is very short on this. Uh, my view is the sooner central banks and authority uh, really. Uh, cranks down on crypto, the better. I mean, I think it's a, it's an asset that we have seen being linked to uh, to dubious activities, money laundering, different kind of trades. Uh, and uh, I, I really do think this is not uh, something that should be sustainable in, in the long term. So my view on this is very short, and I think I'm going to leave it at that. So I will be a little bit more nuanced, but not much more nuanced. Um, <laughs> so um, 
I mean, the, the reason I'm not much more nuanced is that like Sylvia, I think a lot of the crypto activity has been massively beneficial to malign actors, especially organized crime, including, but not exclusively, far from it, from Russia. Uh, and, um, and so I think the authorities have been a bit too uh, tolerant uh, of an instrument that was used for uh, purposes that are detrimental to society. Now, not all the crypto activity is linked to money laundering and crime, uh, but much of it is. Uh, and, uh, and therefore I'm, uh, I'm uh, supportive of the effort, which I think is a little bit belated uh, that is being uh, undertaken right now, uh, separately from the reaction to the Ukrainian invasion uh, in order to put a little bit more discipline into that space. Um, now, on the circumstances here, I mean, crypto, is well suited to war situations and situations of state failure, because in situations of state failure, it can happen that the national currency is actually less, even less credible than a cryptocurrency. Uh, and I don't think that's the case either in Russia or Ukraine right now for different reasons. Russia, because it still has a little bit of that fortress effect, even so it has been, as Sylvia explained very well, undermined we, we, by the we, sanctions. Nicola, sorry, we've seen this like in Venezuela, for example, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, in Venezuela, we have hyperinflation. In Afghanistan, we had complete state fa failure. In, uh, in Zimbabwe, we had hyperinflation as well. So when you have that degree of basically, you know, complete disappearance of the credibility of the state and of the central banks, then crypto becomes uh, a plausible alternative um, store of value and also means of exchange. Um, I don't think we're there either in Russia or in Ukraine, frankly. Uh, Russia still has resources and, uh, and is still able to export its gas and oil. Uh, Ukraine is being supported by uh, its friends. Uh, and uh, there's a very interesting story uh, unfolding, which is the financing of Ukraine, access to liquidity by its central bank, access to the bond market by its sovereign. But at this point, my working assumption is that as long as the Ukrainian government is still functional, and at this point it is under siege, literally, but it is functional, um, it, uh, it will continue to have access to uh, finance, and therefore Ukraine will not be a failed state, and the occupied regions of Ukraine will not be failing either because they will be uh, provided financing by Russia, as Crimea and the Donbass have been in the last eight years. So basically, long story short, crypto is part of the landscape because everything is part of a landscape in a war zone. But I don't think it's at this point supplanting uh, the Ukrainian uh, hryvnia or the Russian ruble yet. I mean, just as a evidence of what Nikola was saying about still uh, remaining credibility, particularly of the Ukrainian state, I mean, Ukraine went out and raised money for war, issuing war bonds. Um, in the middle of a war, when uh, it, I would say it, it would be legitimate for investors to question the ability of the government to repay those bonds that it's trying to sell to raise money for war, uh, and and nevertheless um, it, they're doing it. So I mean I think that's that's uh, strong evidence that still uh, credibility remains there. It's just a small. I don't know if it's small, but it's a follow-up question from uh, one of our listeners about this crypto issue. And then we move on because uh, we are also going towards the end of the episode. Um, he, he, the person say asked, uh, is an anonymous, uh, it doesn't state his name. Could crypto be still used by Russian oligarchs for and for weapon purchase? I mean, you, you were... You were uh, mentioning uh, dubious you know, activities and so on, but uh, and for, and for, unfortunately, Russian oligarchs and the Russian state have access to much uh, stronger finance at this point than crypto. Yeah. So uh, you know, maybe they will use crypto like they use other things, but it's not their only option. So that that answered the question from our listener, and I would like to have one more question from our listeners, and then I have a final question from my side. Um, this is a, again backing back into the systemic uh, discussion and the systemic reflection we were we were having before. Uh, is this uh, war uh, potentially uh, accelerating uh, the decoupling of financial systems? Uh, the, 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 the person specifically says with potentially China, Russia becoming one block and the West becoming another. 
to start. If I get, yeah, um, if I can start, I think, yes. I mean, that's yes, yeah. definitely a shock that goes in that direction. I mean, um, well, China and Russia have been getting closer ever since 2014 in economic terms, in financial terms. Um, I think this is just going to accelerate uh, to accelerate that that dynamic. Now, the question I think also is from the perspective of China, what is the best course of action for them? Uh, and I think for the time being, what what their uh, public positioning at least seems to suggest is that China is again waiting this one out. It's sort of um, not taking obviously a very I don't think anybody expected that a very strong position against uh, what Russia is doing is not uh, proving exceptionally supportive or uh, as some were fearing uh, profiting from this and trying to uh, to uh, move their own acts of aggression to, on Taiwan or um, South China Sea either so they're sort of like uh, in there waiting I think from the perspective of the Chinese, probably the best um, outcome they might get is a weakened Russia uh, that uh, becomes a lot more dependent on China for its economic uh, survival. And at the same time, that gives China access to a reservoir of commodities for a much cheaper price than they would otherwise be paying for. Um, for it. So I think from their perspective, that would be the biggest payoff from, from this situation. Whether that happens um, obviously depends on the, the development on the military front in uh, Ukraine. But at the same time, I think if we take out the scenario of the Russian government just backtracking completely from what they have been doing so far, which I think is very unlikely at this point, um, I don't really see a scenario where sanctions are lifted uh, in in the foreseeable future. So in that respect, I think we're, we're really moving towards uh, towards that scenario of China and Russia becoming more and more closely entangled together. That will depend a, different a lot. take on so this. Uh, I, I, I did agree. Um, oh. I, uh, oh. Uh, sorry, oh, for, okay. For, for, Finally. Finally, we have a little, bit, we have a little we, bit of- In the last three minutes of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, what we're seeing is decoupling of Russia from the rest of the world, and this is happening. For China, um, they have to make a choice because probably they cannot stay coupled with Russia in a big way and at the same time coupled with the rest of the world as they currently are. So I think it's a very difficult situation for the Chinese uh, leadership to be in, especially because they had uh, this big show of unity with Putin on February 4. And there is every indication that Putin misled Xi Jinping, actually, at that point. He was played. Uh, so the Chinese will never admit that. But uh, there are credible indications that he didn't tell Xi Jinping that he would invade Ukraine. And so the Chinese leadership apparently felt, like many other analysts, that you know he, he wouldn't do something so reckless. Uh, and, that and matters. So basically what I'm saying is... The connection with the rest of the world for China is immensely more valuable economically than any connection with Russia. Even if they buy Russia on the cheap, that doesn't match their connection with the rest of the world. So, uh, so I don't think what we're seeing is decoupling of China from the rest of the world. We're seeing decoupling of Russia and China trying to have it both ways, but probably not forever. Thank you. And I take the opportunity to make a little bit of an advertisement because we are going to keep this conversation about Russia and China tomorrow in another episode of our Sound of Economics Live together with Alicia Garciarero and Elina Ribakova. And we are going to exactly discuss and spend a good uh, 45 minutes on this topic because we cannot liquidate it in three seconds at the end of this episode. Now, uh, I wanted to just have one sentence on this, but I know it's like a Pandora box. What more we have to expect? What else, what are the next step sanctions at the financial level that we might accept, um, uh, expect? We cannot close the, 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 the episode without saying at least a word about that. I think the only sanction we really have left that matters is uh, really cutting off uh, the Russian energy provision to ourselves. So in a way, accepting uh, to hurt ourselves in the short run if, uh, if you want to inflict a serious economic damage on, on the Russian economy. Thank you, Silvia. I, 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 agree, I agree on this one, but I think perhaps ahead of this one, there's just 
uh, putting more Russian banks on the list of sanctions, because as I said, the list that was announced today only represents about a quarter of the Russian financial system. It could, and I believe should, go to 100% before uh, we move on to something else. And relatedly, the, the banks that are currently not on, like Gazprom Bank uh, and Spear Bank, exactly. are not on because exactly. uh, they are vital for those energy transactions. So. Perfect. Well, I, I, and we, I, 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 there, I, there's a question we didn't have time to discuss, but just I, we, to point we, we, it for next unfortunately, podcast. unfortunately, I need to. Okay. Unfortunately, I need to cut there the conversation. I know we we can keep on, and we are going to come back to these questions because uh, the yeah, thing but just is. Just to clarify, just to clarify, yeah. uh, I think there are ways to engineer continuation of energy transactions, uh, even if you put uh, most of the Russian banking system uh, on the sanctions list and outside of SWIFT. So that's a technical question, but it's important mm -hmm. in the circumstances, and I think clarifies the exchange we just had. Great. And well, it's not great, but thank you uh, for this clarification, which is extremely important indeed. So thanks. And uh, we we really are going to close now this episode. Uh, uh, I would like to say that part of the story we've been covering in this uh, conversation with Silvia and uh, Nicola is connected to the uh, broader macroeconomic implications of the war. Uh, and this conversation is not over because now I will hand over for another live recording session just after this one, in which uh, Guntram Wolf, the director of Bruegel, with Jean Pisani Ferry and Luis Garicano, will delve into this aspect as well. So stay tuned if you are connected right now and you can keep uh, 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 going a little bit more deep into, into this issue with them. Uh, stay tuned in general with the Sound of Economic and check the previous episodes on our overall coverage of the economic consequences of the war as it unfolds on our website, www.brugel.org. Thanks a lot, Nicola and Silvia, for joining in. Thank you. And, uh, thanks thanks, and thanks to all of you tuning in to listen to the Sound of Economics. Until next time, bye-bye. And a very warm welcome to Bruegel's uh, podcast live. Um, it's an event and a podcast at the same time, The Sound of Economics. My name is Guntram Wolf and I'm the director of Bruegel and I'm really delighted to host today a discussion on the macroeconomic implications of the war of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, what it all means in terms of the European for the European economy, we will also hear, of course, views on what it means uh, for Russia, what the sanctions means. And we do want to talk really about uh, the economics and not about the geopolitics, uh, nor about the war itself. I think there's lots of reporting on that already, and it's a very unpleasant reporting. So, so our, our work here really is as economists to clarify the implications um, on the economic side. And we, we want to start by really talking about the sanctions. Uh, then we want to talk about the macroeconomic implications uh, more specifically. 
And we want to also explore policy options, um, and in particular, the policy options on fiscal and uh, monetary policy and also financial policies. Um, all these policies will be now have to, will have now have to be reassessed in light of this very big uh, shock that the war actually constitutes on the global economy. And uh, I would say it is in many respects like a negative, major neg negative supply shock, um, negative supply shock uh, uh, rendering energy prices um, much, much more costly, um, leading perhaps even to some real scarcity in energy. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, of course, it has impl implications for inflation and for monetary and fiscal policies, which we want to explore. Now, I'm delighted to be today with uh, two uh, very dear friends, um, one former colleague and colleague, uh, former director of Bruegel and colleague, so Jean pisani Ferry, is a senior fellow at, at Bruegel. And um, uh, of course, also let me welcome Luis Garricano, uh, who is uh, a member of the European Parliament for Renew Europe. Um, and also a professor of economics at, uh, former professor of economics, I think at the London School of Economics, if I recall correctly. And so, so we really want to explore these three blocks. So we start with um, sanctions, then we talk about the macroeconomics, and then we talk about um, uh, policies. And um, we also want to give you, our audience, a chance to um, ask one or two questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, please go on Slido and type in the code word um, san sanctions um, macro, sanctions with an S macro, and I will be able to, to read your uh, questions on my smartphone. Um, and uh, and uh, you know we can discuss them here towards the end of um, of this podcast. So, so perhaps we start with um, uh, Luis um, uh, on the sanctions, uh, because uh, Luis, um, you've been very active thinking about uh, what it all means. And, you know, we, I, I would love to hear from you. Uh, what's your take on the effects of the sanctions? And, you know, do we go far enough? Um, should we go further? And um, how do you see the situation around the sanctions? So I, I think there is the, the good and the bad. I think that uh, I'm, I've been very, very impressed with the decisions to block the reserves of the uh, Russian Central Bank. I, when, when we all started to talk about it, it seemed like a crazy far-fetched idea that they wouldn't have the guts to, to install in a few hours later. It, wasn't, it went from absolutely impossible to a reality uh, in a very short time. Uh, this basically means for our listeners that of the 650 billion, uh, roughly, uh, dollars uh, reserves of the Russian Central Bank, half are unreachable. They've been joined by Japan, uh, France, Germany, the Eurozone, uh, the UK, and the US. Basically, what it means is that the physical cash uh, is, is, is very scarce. There's only maybe 12 billion between euros and dollars in, in Russia. Most of the reserves are in the form of of accounts in these banks and and basically what these banks these central banks are telling the russian central bank is look you can't touch this money to protect the ruble and what that's going to mean is that both in terms of the maintaining financial stability maintaining the purchasing power of the ruble etc the, the central bank of russia is going to be pretty handicapped and they're, they're pressing hard and i will talk about the bad now, which is the, the, the big transfers of energy we are sending. Uh, so that, that's the best part. Uh, there is a little bit of a make-believe part with, with SWIFT, I think, because at the end of the day, yeah, we're excluding some banks, and that's going to be significant. But there, we are leaving other banks there, and, and the money, the payments can go through whatever hold you leave. So as long as some banks are open, it doesn't matter. You can just have a, 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 an account with one of those banks and, and get it done. So this leads me to the third and last point, which is the energy. The reason I say the sanctions are not fully effective is that we are sending over, right now, over a billion dollars a day to pay for gas, to pay for oil, to, to put into Russia. So the basic, the Russian Central Bank, what it's doing is it's demanding the importers, Gazprom and company, to use 80% of the reserves, immediately change them into rubles, thus generating a huge flow of reserves <coughs> day after day that can be used and that is being used, obviously, to maintain the value of the rule. So we are ourselves neutering the impact of those sanctions by basically financing 
uh, very richly the purchase of gas and, and oil. Of course, we understand and we'll get into that in the next round, I guess, that Europe, particularly Germany and other countries in the East are very dependent on Russian gas, not just for energy, but also for heating. But to me, either we are serious and we want to incur serious costs that I'm happy to mutualize and we'll talk later, or we should just not, uh, not be playing this game. John. I'm exactly on the same line. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the sanctions have been uh, effective in attacking the, the stock dimension, the, 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 the chest of the, of the Russian Central, Central Bank. Now, there is a, the flow dimension, and the flow dimension is absolutely major in, in quantitative terms. We're speaking of a country that had a surplus, uh, a surplus on the, the current account, even when, when gas and oil prices were, were very low, and that's how it built its, uh, its uh, uh, reserves. Now, the price being five times of gas, being five times what it was you know, a year ago, it's been the, the flow is absolutely, absolutely huge. Uh, uh, so something like uh, you know 200, uh, even you, you're saying more than one billion a day, but even in a sort of conservative assumption, 200 billion per, per year, which is which is enormous. Meaning that we have to to be clear: uh, if we are telling the Russians we are paying the gas, but you can't use the money, then there is no point for them in exporting the gas. If we're telling them uh, we have a carve out. You can use the money. We're making actually the, the sanction uh, ineffective. So we have a choice to make. And I think in this regard, we have to be very clear about the sort of a, you know, the game of chicken between, between Europe and, and, and Russia. Oil can be sold everywhere. Coal can be sold everywhere. Gas can only be sold where there is infrastructure to, to sell. And so the Russia is dependent on the European market. Uh, so there is an asymmetry here. And the asymmetry is in favor of, of Europe because for Europe, uh, imports of gas from Russia, they represent 9% of the total primary energy consumption in Europe. So this is important in certain countries. This is even major in certain countries, but for the EU as a whole, it's not such a big number. So by combination of cutting a bit the consumption of gas, uh, diversifying sources of, of supply um, and having the solidarity, uh, in, you know, in, in very concrete terms, in ensuring that that uh, uh, member states in the EU can have access to energy, we can reduce the flow at least. But I, you see, if we're not really serious about reducing the flow, we're not serious about sanctions. Well, let me disagree on this point. I, also, that we start having having a good debate. I think it's not a it's not a surprise that um, gas limiting gas exports is widely seen as a counter sanction that Vladimir Putin wants to impose on us, and not as a primary sanction that we want to impose um, on on Russia. And the reason is 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 very simple: if we are cut off from gas. Um, it's going to be, it's feasible to survive, but it's going to be quite difficult um, to, to get through the next winter, as we have calculated. Um, and the solidarity within the EU is actually going to be very difficult also because some gas pipelines are missing, et cetera, et cetera. But more pro fundamentally, the question is how much it would really hit Vladimir Putin. And let me just be very clear here. Um, the main revenues that Putin makes are not from gas. I mean, he makes the revenues from oil, um, not from gas. Oil is much more important as a revenue generating uh, machine than, than gas is. And that's why um, he, uh, and as you both pointed out, I mean, oil is a global market and there will be buyers of oil. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to actually limit the revenues he makes on, on oil unless you stop the, uh, the oil tankers or you stop um, using, using the, uh, you, you prohibit him from using the revenues on the oil. So the key is the oil um, and, and the gas is, is relatively, a relatively small proportion of the overall revenues. Now, what is further, if there's no gas in Europe from Russia, of course, we will have to substitute away from gas. We will have to consume other sources of energy. And that's going to be coal and oil, um, and of course, nuclear and, and, and renewables. 
And so, so a stop of Russian gas will also mean global energy prices will go up and usually the, the oil and the, the gas prices are quite linked. So it's actually quite possible that the increase in oil prices will even more than offset um, the, the lost revenues on gas. So I'm not sure that Europe would be well advised to really start on the gas. Um, we, we, should, we should start on the financial sanctions, which we have done on the gas. Um, I doubt it will be a strong hit on him, uh, but it will be a bigger hit uh, on us. The, the reason that the financial sanctions are not really working as they should is because we have a carve out. And the reason for the carve out is not the oil, it's the gas. The real problem for Europe the real source of dependency, the real place where he has us over the barrel is gas. We can buy oil anywhere. The same way he can sell it anywhere. We can buy it anywhere. The moment we limit our dependency on gas, and you're right, we need to work a lot on LNG, uh, liquefied natural, natural gas uh, plants. We have a lot of capacity in Spain, which is idle. We need to build uh, ways to bring that to Germany, etc. But the, the moment we start working on, on limiting that dependency on gas, we can actually raise the swift uh, sanctions to the real level at which we should be, which is basically excluding all banks, all payments from SWIFT. And then I think we're starting to hurt him also on the oil and the gas. I agree with you that the oil is, is a world market. Um, also, that's the reason why I don't think a lot of this gas demand from Europe, this 9% of energy of Europe, and reduce that by how much are we not going to be reducing uh, with LNG, substituting with LNG, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were calculations, <laughs> there were calculations uh, before the war started that suggested that we can more replace more than half of that, uh, of that LNG uh, through LNG. So I, I, I do think this is a joke, uh, Guntram. I mean, I think it's a joke that you say, oh, you know, we're putting all these sanctions, but here's a check. That we're going to send you every day for over a billion. No, By the way, Jean, I oil. think the reason, Jean, I but think you the have reason to stop on numbers... oil, Luis. You have to stop. You have to stop. Uh, at the end of the day, if you really want to be effective, you have to stop him selling the oil. And then no, you... but I mean, you can extort the oil. Shift. We can, we can, we can put obstacles. I mean, it's going to be more. Yeah, that's what you should do. But but it's not going to be sufficient because it's, it's not and or. There, it's there also. will be there will be someone willing yeah, to compare buy this compare the revenues on oil with the revenues on gas. I mean he's he's making the revenues on oil, not on gas. The the, uh, the the point is, are you are you saying we should also be doing oil? In which case, of course, I think Jean and me are both going to say, of course. No, or we are you saying the oil? Uh, we, we're going to try to do everything. I mean, the point here is that this is really a situation without precedent that is going to cost Europe much, much more than a bad winter. This is going, if, if he wins here, the next time it's going to be Estonia, it's going to be Lithuania, it's going to show he can take an, an yeah, that's NATO why member. You have to, that's why you have to take him on the oil and you have to... And on the gas. Be careful, we agree. You have to we be agree. careful. Let's do everything we can do on the oil. Yes, as well. Okay, so then that's if we as, don't as do on well. gas, we, we are on the losing side. So I think we should we should do gas, and it's going to be painful, you know. But it's not going to be impossible. There is a Bruegel paper out saying precisely it can be done. I mean, it's difficult. Well, of course, it can. Fortunately, it's spring, so we don't the need uh, for, for, for gas. It's not as if we were in October, so we have time. Uh, we have time to to you know organize the, the distribution of gas, as which which was explaining, use the spare capacity, import LNG from uh, from the exporting countries, but we have to be very clear from the start. And if we're not clear from the start, we're going nowhere. No, I really think you have to look at the general equilibrium effects and see how much um, this has an effect on the on the prices per, per se. I mean, so far he is having a great crisis because. Everybody knows Russia is a main exporter, and as the exports uh, become more 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 delicate, uh, everybody is stocking, and the prices go up like crazy. So, so we have to think very carefully about uh, how much um, the uh, oil price is going to go up as a consequence of stopping stopping gas. That's the point I was making. Now, I I haven't done the the general equilibrium effects myself fully, but but Europe is a major. Uh, demand of Russian gas, and if that has to be uh, uh, substituted with oil, it will have implications on global oil markets. I would really focus much more on thinking about how can we increase global oil supply. I mean, can we not yeah, really sure. armstrong um, uh, Saudi Arabia 
into really producing much more and flooding the global markets with oil. That would be really the most effective sanction on, on Russia at this stage. Um, so, so that's my view on this, but I don't know. We perhaps I mean, I, I think in terms that it's it's very hard to argue that he's having a great crisis. I mean, uh, today the price of the Gazprom shares was zero point zero one one cent, went from uh, sixteen dollars uh, to a cent uh, in the London market. The price of the main share bank, the main Russian bank, is at one cent. I mean. Uh, I don't think Russia no, is by I any means terms. having a great crisis. I no, think no, they're, they're really oh, hurting no, the sanctions. The, of the gas market. Um, okay, the, 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 the sanctions market. are hurting. The sanctions are hurting. And I think we need to really intensify dramatically those sanctions if we want to basically collapse the financial system, which is what the only hope we have of creating a fast enough crisis in Russia. Well, let, let's talk about this, and I mean, I, I, I'd love to hear just, you. Just a point, how much Wilfram, if I may. You, you can't have it both ways. I mean, you can't explain at the same time that, that gas is secondary for Russia and that it's vital for the, the global uh, energy balance. I mean, if it's small, it's small. Uh, so um, you're, you're telling us, you know, if we, you do it, it's not going to be major for Russia, but it's going to be major for the price of oil. No, I mean, it, it, it can't be. I agree. Uh, why not? I mean, because it's either or, either it's it's big or it's small. But uh, if it's if it's uh, if it's small for Russia, it's even smaller for the world. So it's not going to change the the, the prices, uh, the general equilibrium. I don't know. I mean, I think what we are seeing currently in the markets looks looks other looks differently. But um, but let's talk a bit about. Um, you know, on what it means for the Russian economy, what all of this means for the Russian economy, if we have a minute, because of course, um, a lot, as you say, Luis, and I think I fully agree on that point, it's, it, it is having already major effects on the Russian economy. I mean, we've seen uh, the ruble uh, literally collapsing, um, the, the banks um, that have been um, subject to sanctions rightfully have been, um, I think, uh, losing uh, market capitalization to, to a massive extent. So, so this is already very, very serious on the Russian economy. So, so what, um, what's your take on, on how bad it is really for, for Russia and you know, how much more it will take? I think that uh, the key is the, is the cash uh, that we are sending every day. I mean, as long as we are sending uh, these, these, these quantities, by the way, I was going to say before, Jean, and I think the way the two quantities that we've seen are compatible is that the spring is coming and the total payments of gas are going to go down. Uh, and that's why the average is, 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 is compatible with the, with the daily flow. Um, the, the, I think the sense that I have is that it's going to get very bad, but that it's not probably going to get to the point of collapse because of this. That's what we saw with the ruble. We saw a very, very large drop. And then it's kind of stabilized, and we've seen that with with, with other other indicators. So um, I think the Central Bank of Russia, using the Chinese, the deposits in China, uh, the gold, and the, the flow of money arriving, could just have enough to make it subsist at very bad and not it get catastrophic. And we need catastrophic if we're going to have enough pressure on Putin to pull back. I mean, we need people in the streets uh, to be asking Putin to pull back because they are, their savings are volatilizing. And my sense is that the sanctions are biting, they're biting hard, but not getting to that point. So, so how do you come, or Jean, do you see that differently? I mean, how do you come to the sense of where it's really bad and where it's just bad? I mean, so, I'm only so looking at the ruble. Uh, the interest the rate has, has gone up, uh, has been doubled. Um, from nine and a half uh, to twenty, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so people people are starting to buy iPhones uh, to as a as a store of value. Um, so it looks already. I mean, what what else? What, what is it that you think one one could really try to achieve with with further sanctions and and how? For me, the rule. There's one. The, the I mean, there's a destabilization um, that's that's going on. Uh, uh, and then there is a type of uh, you know, type of balance in which the, the Russian economy could, could find itself. Uh, so uh, Russia does not produce durable goods. I mean, uh, Russia massively it's an exporter of raw materials and importer of durable goods. So for 
for <laughs> consumption, for equipment, it relies on, on, on the global market and it relies on what's being supplied by, by Europe. So the question is, you know, if, if you're sufficiently effective, you're blocking that and with, with visible consequences for, for output, with visible consequences for, for consumption and with visible consequences obviously for inflation. So we have to think also the sort of end game in which the Russian economy becomes um, a sort of managed economy in which there is no market anymore. Uh, but the, the question of you know, what, what the flow that comes in and, and, and what the, the balance that makes it possible uh, to, to sustain a certain level of consumption and investment. Uh, we are sort of moving, I think, from the sort of high frequency, you know, uh, shock effect to this question of where we, we're going. And, and it can be a war economy. I mean, we're moving into a war economy in Russia. We're moving increasingly into a war economy in Europe. Um, and, and, and the reasoning there is different. I mean, it's, it's not just about markets, it's also about underlying balances. Benjamin, if I can go back uh, to, to, to connect these two ideas, uh, yeah. that I think that, that uh, uh, the financial situation, which I say I call bad but not desperate, I am looking at the ruble, basically. I was expecting uh, to, be, to be able to sink it more to date. I think it's been just 3%. But I agree with Jean on the long run, and I, I have a nice anecdotal, uh, a nice anecdote which is from an aviation expert today, in Twitter, going very carefully over the aviation market. And what basically he was explaining is: Look, um, you need to repair these planes. You have normally pieces for three weeks. Uh, you don't have any pieces. Uh, GE already has said they're not repairing the planes. Uh, Rolls Royce, same thing. None of the Western companies they are Boeing and Airbus basically are going to to ship pieces or do repairs. Plus, they cannot fly over anywhere in Europe or et cetera. So basically, he was claiming that within three weeks, the whole system, the leases in Ireland are being canceled. Within three weeks, the whole aviation system of the US, of, of Russia will be disappeared, basically. So that's one example in which they get to this subsistence economy or this, or this, this situation Jean was, was mentioning. But it's not the acute, it's more the long-term, the, the medium-term damage. It's not the acute... It's not the acute, I, I would have liked to see after this Sunday, which is if really we have closed SWIFT and if, if, if uh, there hadn't been payments coming in, I think we would have basically seen the banks, all of the banks collapse. And we, they managed to stave that off. Right. Okay, so, so let's talk a bit about um, what it all means for the global economy and the European economy um, in particular. Uh, I mean, this is, of course, a major uncertainty shock it's a major supply side shock um, and it's a major shock in in energy prices um, which really increases a lot the dilemmas that we are all confronted with I mean already prior to um, this war there were very serious dilemmas for the central bank and for others by by seeing that uh, energy prices were driving up inflation um, unemployment at record low, so it was time actually to hike rates. Um, at the same time, the, the usual fragilities in the eurozone were, were re-emerging. So, so a lot of worry at that stage. Uh, how how fast can one can one tighten um, monetary uh, and fiscal policies? And and of course now um, the situation gets more complicated because on the one hand. This entrenches um, the, the negative supply shocks that some were arguing were perhaps temporary, but now look perhaps even less so temporary or, I mean, a series of temporary shocks, I guess at some stage becomes a permanent shock. Um, so, so, so there is a policy question, you know, do you need to tighten? But on the other hand, of course, the uncertainty uh, um, really calls for doing exactly the opposite, um, namely um, more uh, accommodative uh, monetary policy or continuing with the current accommodative monetary policy so that fiscal policy makers actually do have the space to, to react um, and um, uh, buffer um, some of the consequences of, of the current energy hike um, on European consumers, spend more on defense, etc. So, so this is actually quite a quite a bad situation from a policy making point point of view. And so, so I'd love to hear Jean perhaps first on on this, and then Louis, please, Jean. It is it is a bad situation. I mean, it is coming on top of the situation we were seeing, where you know we had this inflationary shock, um, and 
it's 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 more of it uh, clearly, and uh, so we have the, the the confidence shock, negative confidence shock. We we may see a slowdown in in global growth, and on top of that, we have this uh, this major uh, effect on on prices. Now, in principle, what you should do, I mean, the standard theory is that if there is a stepwise increase in the price of energy, you have to you don't have to react to the stepwise increase. You know, the central bank has to react to the second round effect. So if it creates sort of more permanently more inflation, so which is what it's called looking through uh, the um, uh, the increase. Um, at present, so far, we don't see second round effects. I mean, we don't see a de-anchoring of inflation expectation, etc. But it's becoming increasingly difficult for the ECB in a context where public opinion is worried about inflation, not, not to react. So the question is how to make the life of the ECB um, easier and how to avoid this type of uh, overreaction. I think the, uh, the means have to be uh, fiscal. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the monetary policy cannot really do it alone. So um, the, the, there are ways in which um, households can be protected from the, the, these price rises. And even more, I would say, uh, uh, there are ways for, for fiscal policy or for regulatory policy to step in and to limit the rise in prices. So I'm speaking of a price intervention. But just to take an example, we have this electricity market in which the price of electricity is indexed on the price of the marginal energy, which is gas. So uh, when the price of gas increases, the price of electricity increases across the board. This cannot be a good response in this type of situation. I mean, there, are, there is discussion on whether it's a good system in principle, but in this type of situation, it's not a good system. So you have to break this link between uh, the uh, price of, of gas and the overall price of energy, including electricity, even if electricity is produced with renewables, with nuclear, with coal, with whatever, but not gas. Uh, so I think that's the type of intervention we are forced to consider, even though you know we normally don't like this type of intervention. So, so Jean, just because also there's a, and since you mentioned the renewable, um, there is a question here, and let me try to bring in some questions from our audience because we are already uh, coming to the last twelve minutes, um, which is about the renewables and you know how quickly we can we can shift to renewables and you know whether it can really uh, at what at what time horizon this this can make make a difference. Um, I mean, I think personally in the mix there's of course also the nuclear and um, and the and the coal um, and nuclear some power, nuclear power plants are there and can be kept on instead of being switched off um, in the country I know best so there's some scope to 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 decouple there um, but but what's your what's your take on the renewable because there was a question here in the audience and then I come to you Luis I am 100% in favor of developing renewables very fast but uh, you know renewables need a backup when there is no wind or when there is no, there is no sun. And the, the standard backup is gas. So it's not really the, the answer. I think in the short term, we have to consider what you, you were saying. So sort of uh, to postpone some of the, uh, of the changeover uh, of the energy system, which is going to be very difficult political decision for the coalition in Germany, because uh, it's committed to accelerating this, this transformation. But we're not speaking, uh, hopefully, of, of years. We're speaking of a you know, short-term response to the situation. I think there are nuclear plants that are scheduled to close this year. I would, uh, in this type of situation, I would just you know, suspend the closure. Luis, uh, your take on the, on the macro situation. So, so I, my, my take is pretty similar to Jean. At the end, all the, all the roads lead to a, a new European fiscal response. So my view is that uh, the, the, the monetary uh, response has been uh, already very powerful and that it has created uh, the risk of inflation. I think when, when you do things and you don't pay for them, inflation follows. That's usually what happens. And I think we've seen, we've seen some, some of that. Uh, so I think that the key now is to have uh, the bank proceed very cautiously, the central bank very cautiously. I wouldn't make big announcements of rate raises, and I wouldn't give a huge import to the 
to the inflation figure, which is going to be too high, obviously, in the next month. Uh, that will be the second big deviation. And, and in this current circumstances, I would be cautious with that. But at the same time, I think the fiscal authorities have to recognize this is a huge asymmetric shock. Um, there are going to be countries which are very much affected, in this case, more the ones in the East that take all this gas. And we need to help together in Europe to develop an alternative. Uh, Jean has written a, a very nice think piece already thinking through, through how much it would cost. Uh, to think about alternatives, to start to change structural, uh, structural changes, to make sure that we have the LNG capacity for next winter. Uh, and, and all of these changes are going to cost money, I think it has to be European money. The real big elephant in the room for Europe is still the same big elephant that you and, and Jean and me and many others have been worrying already for, for 12 years, which is uh, the, the Euro crisis where spreads uh, take off from each other and people start to worry again about what can happen with the euro. And, and the way to avoid that is uh, we need, I think, to have at least some flexibility in QE, in quantitative easing, uh, sorry for the, for the audience, that uh, I think we this idea of the reinvestment, just with reinvesting is going to be enough. I don't see how, and I would love to hear Jean and you on this, how just taking the, the bonds, the money that we get from stopping QE on German bonds and kind of letting them run off, uh, taking that money and investing it into Spanish and Italian bonds, I don't know if, how long that is politically sustainable, but Guntram, you know much more about, about that, that uh, political sustainability than I know from, from the German perspective. But um, <coughs> this idea that, sorry, I'm making, making it maybe a bit too complicated. Let me see if I can make it very, very easy. The central bank says, we said until a week ago, we're going to raise interest rates. In order to that, we have to, to do that. We have to stop QE. But don't worry. When we stop QE, we still have to re reinvest all the money that uh, all, all the all the investments in bonds from the different countries that can do and that we cancel. And all this money that we invest will give us the ability to do stuff. And what I'm trying to argue here is that's probably not going to be enough to control spreads if we have big fiscal shocks in certain countries. That's why. I would continue keeping some queue even if interest rates have to move. And I would hope that the fiscal response is European and not national. Well, I mean, so, so, so basically, um, if I if I understand you correctly, you would you would probably not raise rates or decide on the raising of rates and delay um, getting out of QE, but at the same time really accelerate with a European financial instrument. Uh, so that we are less worried about about spreads and and the European financial instrument is also something if I may uh, self advertise here re a recent piece um, that uh, I wrote with a few colleagues in foreign affairs where we are actually saying we need some sort of a European uh, next generation EU it's, it can be relatively mm -hmm. small but something to to help compensate um, totally. and and actually keep unity geopolitical unity also in the EU um, uh, on, the, on this. And I think the logic is very simple. I mean, it's, it's a geopolitical uh, confrontation. And if Europe wants to use um, its geopolitical force, it has to stay united. And that means also some internal uh, side payments might might have to be have to have uh, might be needed, but but again, I think um, I, I would love to push you both a little bit more on on the fiscal side, and I, I mean, I do agree with you that um, the ECB uh, uh, has to be very careful um, because um, because of the spread issue. Um, now, at the same time, what we know now is that this 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 will cost a lot of money for the taxpayers, right? I mean, it will take, cost a lot of taxpayers money to help households compensate for higher energy prices. So there, we are already talking for countries like Italy, double digit billion numbers. Um, then we will have additional uh, defense spending, which is um, Germany has just basically decided um, it wants to have some sort of a golden rule on, on defense spending um, alongside the kind of golden rule they have already on, on green, green climate spending. Um, so so there, there are major fiscal um, implications the and major fiscal decisions, and so so how do how do we square all of this, and can we really just say we accept higher inflation and you know we put it on on the savers and and the small 
small incomes that will lose lose out from higher inflation. So how do we deal with this, Jean? Hmm. No, first of all, I mean, you know, the as you said, I mean, the, the, the fiscal dimension, it is, it is unavoidable. And you can, I mean, defense spending was speaking of 0.5% of GDP for most of Europe, if not all of Europe, um, in the course of, you know, two, three years annually. I mean, you know, and, and a, a stepwise increase um, of this uh, investment into, into securities that was completely unexpected. Then we have the short-term cost of refugees. If we have, you know, a few million refugees in, 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 in Poland, uh, we've got to help the refugees. We have the energy dimension and the rebuilding of the, the energy infrastructure. Uh, and we have the, the, the short-term measures to sort of offset the, uh, uh, the implication of the, these price increases. So, so we're speaking of, you know, uh, significant money. We're speaking of one, two percent of GDP in the short term in terms of uh, additional uh, toll. Uh, so the question is, um, as you said, I mean, who is going to pay for it? Um, uh, eventually, uh, this means higher taxes. Uh, eventually, he, this means, you know, we have to pay permanently. We're speaking, defense spending is going to be permanent. I mean, as far as I can see. Uh, so, so there needs to be permanent uh, revenues in, in front of it. And, and, and this is to be added to the additional investment uh, on, uh, on the green transition, which on the public side is about half a percentage point of the GDP, as you have yourself calculated. So we're speaking of a permanent increase by, by 1% of GDP or lasting increase by 1% of GDP. So tax increase. So, so, so that, you know, is a short term extent. I mean, we're not going to raise taxes at uh, this uh, very moment. Um, it will be tested in the market. So that's why effectively the, uh, uh, the response of the ECB is extremely important. And I see no reason why the ECB shouldn't be able, I mean, the ECB has a huge portfolio of, of sovereign bonds. I mean, it can also reshuffle partially uh, its, its portfolio. I mean, there's nothing that prevents it in principle in the, in the, in the PEP program. Right? Uh, in a way, it's a sort of spread control, but I'm not in favor of the spread control permanently, but it, no, in this type of situation, uh, uh, we're speaking of it. I mean, the, uh, it, it was done in the COVID crisis, de facto. It has to be done in this crisis also, de facto. I mean, for me, it's, Jean, there's a question of political feasibility. If you think it's feasible, I think it's a good idea economically. Question about it. Um, so, 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 Guntram, I mean, I, I would, I would want to, to, to uh, add one thing to what Jean is saying, which I fully, fully support uh, uh, what he said. So, the question is, how do you combine medium-run, long-run fiscal discipline with the kind of expenditure, debt finance expenditure we're talking about, one, two percent of GDP, which I think is a Pretty reasonable ballpark if you include defense. Um, and I think the kind of thing that I've been arguing for, you, you saw the Vox EU uh, paper that I published under, under precisely Jean's uh, editorship, um, has to have a combination, a credible combination, in which Europe says, look, we are doing this as Europeans. Uh, we need to buy similar components. We need to, to do all these defense spending. The refugee is a European problem. The energy is a European problem. We're going to do this as Europeans. But we need you countries to be serious about taxes. Because if you're not serious about, about raising this money, I mean, all the bets are off. Then we are just going into a path which we know where it finishes, uh, in Venezuela or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, so what I, the kind of solution I was arguing is um, you tell countries, as long as you're doing certain things that we can discuss, uh, which have to do with an expenditure rule, etc., you're in good standing. We are going to let you use this for the FEN expenditure for refugees X, Y, Z. Okay, I, I don't care exactly. I was thinking of environmental expenditure, but it can be it can be broader than that. But the important thing is linking the debt finance expenditure that we need today with rules that are enforceable and that are enforced. And 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 I think sticks don't work. We have found out already sticks don't work. You cannot go to a parliament of a country and say, if you don't do this, we're going to. Uh, to take this away from you because voters don't accept it, parliaments don't accept it. But you can say, look, this is here's 20 billion for next year. Um, condition. You want, this is the condition. Yeah. 
I feel I think this is very, very clear, and I think we all agree. And in the short term, that will will play a role to smooth the effect. I mean, this is um, a very strong immediate shock, and the medium term might be. I mean, uh, let's hope that energy prices will not, <laughs> if or forever, stay where they are. So some of the the current expenses um, can be smoothed, um, and in that sense, we we should we should have that instrument. And I personally think we need a European debt instrument to uh, to really. Um, uh, deal with this from a geopolitical point of view also and you know to be to remain united vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Russia in this situation. Um, perhaps the very last question which we got um, is on the war economy and I think Luis you mentioned it or Jean I don't remember um, the term war economy and what the war economy term would uh, what does that mean actually for the EU? Um, and it was all, Jean it was Jean who used it. It was Jean um, I mean, the war economy in Russia, I see, but in the EU, um, that, that, that's a question by Katarina Gnat. It's not, it's, it's obviously an exaggeration. But what I mean by that is that there's a sort of standard reasoning in some cases does not apply. You know, in a war economy, you have a, a very different uh, assignment of your, your tools to the different goals. Uh, um, uh, and that it beats the situation we, we're finding uh, ourselves in. That's why I was saying, you know, use fiscal policy to limit the, the consequences, the effects of, uh, of price rises. Normally, you, you wouldn't do that in a normal situation. But in this type of situation, I think it's, it's, uh, it's necessary. So that's what I mean, you know, more sort of a, you know, government-driven allocation, uh, less room for market mechanisms temporarily. I think it has to be accepted that a sort of a different type of of rules of the of the situation we're finding ourselves in, but I, we know, for example, if you think longer term, I wouldn't say, and I think that's a danger that's coming, that everything has to be done internally, that you know we have to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world, that we have to end globalization. I think this is this is nonsense. We have to think more in terms of resilience, in terms of autonomy, but we should remain an open economy and we should remain fundamentally market driven economy. The question, Jean, where that might might be open to consideration is do we want, as in the past, to be open driven, open, open market economy also with respect to trading with dictators and autocrats? I think what this has put in the question is Absolutely. this idea that we can separate trade from politics. And and I, I think that uh, we will have to reevaluate of this crisis, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. they, democratic conditionality, if you want, of our trade agreements. Good topic for our next uh, podcast. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, there's so many topics we could, we could talk further about. I mean, I, I, I would have loved to also hear your views on, you know, sanctioning further the oligarchs and, you know, whether we really um, are tough enough on them and what it all means for, for Europe. So any quick views on that? If you have a quick view on that, please, please let me know. Um, I, and I, I do some uh, the customary British bashing in these things. I mean, if you look at the list of crown properties and crown territories and all that, I mean, okay, just three three facts. One, you know that very few countries have as much wealth concentrated on very few people. Second, very, very few countries have uh, the few people that concentrate their wealth have it offshore. All these oligarchs have taken the money offshore. And third, all these offshore locations are ours. The crown territories of the UK, their territories of the United States, their territories of some European countries. This is a piece of cake if we want to do it. So exactly. uh, I think that we have to do much more. Yeah, there is a fascinating research by Gabriel Zuckman showing, you know, Russia in comparison to other countries. This is just incredible how much. Incredible. Wells is is outside. How much is is held by a tiny minority? So, so I think that that's something that has to be tackled. Thanks for the quote because I didn't mention. Thank you, Stuckman, thank you so much. For, thank you so much for being clear also on this point, which I really think is is key. I mean, we we cannot allow um, the rich of Russia to get away with this. Um, the rich that, in particular, the ones that have been part of. Uh, the Putin, the Putin machine. So, so this this needs to be uh, very much on top of the sanctioning list in my in my view. And John, you want to say one? Yes. One more word, we, and then we, I want to conclude. Under the, under the rule of law. Uh, yes. Under the rule under of, the law. Rule of so law. law. The rule of law is free. 
the freeze is is easily feasible. I think what what Gabriel and uh, Gabriel Zuckman and, and what what PKT want is a confiscatory tax, and I think I, I would love I would love to find a way to make that feasible. And I'm to be absolutely honest, I'm working on that. I hope nobody posts some bologna in my drink for saying. That. No, no. I thank you, thank you both. This is this is really important, and I really think we have talked about so many things. But I think we agree we need very tough sanctions. Uh, Russia needs to feel it. Um, the Putin regime <laughs> needs to feel it. We agree that uh, macroeconomically this will have major implications, and we also agree that policymakers will need to show some ingenuity, some staying together on the policy front in fiscal and monetary policies to really smooth the effects of this, this major uh, war um, right next to our doors. Um, I think there will be more uh, opportunities to discuss further in the coming weeks. Um, next week, we will host a podcast with um, Sergei Guriev um, to hear uh, from him uh, on the impact on Russia and how he sees the situation. Um, and I'm sure there will be many more um, uh, issues um, coming up in our podcast series and elsewhere. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Jean. Thank you, Louise. It was great to discuss with you. Thank you. Thanks for your pleasure. Right. Always happy to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.